Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is uh, Pasi Yenne. I'm from the uh, Dana-Farber Cancer Institute in Boston, Massachusetts. I uh, run our uh, thoracic oncology program uh, here at Dana-Farber, and I'm also a uh, professor of medicine at uh, Harvard Medical School. Um, today, I'm just going to discuss with you uh, some insights into acquired resistance, and uh, we'll talk a little bit about uh, repeat biopsies and, and also some general concepts of how we're trying to uh, approach acquired resistance when that occurs uh, in individuals treated uh, with our targeted therapies. These are just uh, uh, disclosures. So I wanted to start out with uh, uh, first, uh, uh, with some definitions of drug resistance. I think we sometimes lump drug resistance into uh, a broad category, but I think it's helpful to try to understand some of the differences in resistance when they happen, because I think our approaches to that are also different. So. Um, so let's go through these. So, for example, de novo resistance. So I think, or, or primary resistance, as this is sometimes referred to. So someone who would uh, be expected to respond to a therapy that doesn't. So someone who has a RET alteration, as you just heard from Dr. Reyes, and is treated with a RET inhibitor but doesn't respond to therapy. Clearly, there's a disconnect there between having the right genetic alteration and the response. And sometimes we have an understanding of why that happens, but not always. Probably the most common category that we talk about and think about is acquired resistance, meaning that regrowth of a cancer following an initial clinical benefit. So someone who has one of those dramatic uh, <clears throat> radiographic responses that you saw earlier this morning, but ultimately uh, develops regrowth of their cancer while on the drug. And that's typically what we're talking about uh, when we uh, talk about resistance. There are other categories. Sometimes we talk about a state called drug persistent disease. So somebody has a dramatic response uh, to a targeted therapy or immunotherapy, but the disease doesn't completely go away. There's still a portion of the cancer there that's present uh, even while you're uh, being treated with a drug. And this is what we often refer to as persistent disease. And this may be, again, functionally and biologically be uh, quite different. And finally, pharmacologic resistance. Not all of our therapies including many of our chemotherapies and even immune therapies, and even some of our targeted therapies can access uh, all sites in the body. And the brain or the leptomeninges are certainly one such area. One can have a tremendous uh, uh, therapeutic benefit systemically, but can develop disease progression uh, in, the, in these parts of the body, not because the drug is not working, but the drug can't get into that location. And, and again, thinking about strategies and identifying drugs that uh, uh, have the ability to cross the blood-brain barrier. And fortunately, many of our newer generation targeted therapies achieve that goal. Um, but uh, this is yet another type of category. Now, we talked a little bit about uh, uh, liquid biopsies and tissue biopsies, and I made this table to kind of compare and contrast. And I would agree with uh, uh, Dr. Weiss that these are complementary approaches. Um, so, but let's look at some of the potential uh, differences. So can we do these in everybody? So tissue biopsies, no. Um, some sites are impractical to biopsy. Some sites are unsafe to biopsy. Um, and, and I think that is a, a consideration. Liquid biopsy, you can do in everybody because you can draw blood in everybody. However, sensitivity uh, of these varies. And it depends a little bit on where the disease is located in, in individuals, for example, where disease is located predominantly in the thoracic cavity, um, but not elsewhere in the body, the uh, sensitivity of these types of assays is lower. Somebody who develops progression of disease on a therapy where that progression is predominantly in the brain or in the, in the leptomeninges, the sensitivity of one of these ass liquid biopsies is lower. So again, one needs to understand that. We mentioned histology. Of course, you can get histology from tissue biopsies, and I'll show you some examples of why histology may be important, and we can't get that from liquid biopsies. And of course, when you can't do histology, you can't do those protein-based analyses, pdl one expression, and others. What about time uh, to genotyping results? And here there are some differences, of course. Uh, um, the uh, tissue biopsies, uh, if you're doing sort of uh, uh, next generation sequencing where you look for lots of different genetic alterations, you know, this is weeks, two to three weeks. Specimen also needs to undergo pathology processing first. So the pathologists have to say, yes, this is cancer. There's, you know, they've, they've looked at the appropriate sections and then those have to be sent uh, for uh, uh, analyses at a, at a next generation sequencing laboratory, either locally or, or, or in a send out type of fashion. 
Uh, from a liquid biopsy, it depends a little bit on the assay. If you're looking for a single genetic alteration, if you're looking for EGFR T790M or a single EGFR alteration or a single ALK point mutation, some assays are quite quick uh, that are just looking for those and you can get a result in 24 to 72 hours. If one uh, uses uh, 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 next generation sequencing again, uh, these take usually a, in, a around the ballpark of 10 days, so a little bit faster uh, for most of the places uh, than, than uh, tumor-based sequencing, uh, but still uh, uh, you know, uh, in, in the 10-day period. Uh, what about the evaluation of resistance heterogeneity, as was brought up earlier? Uh, it's limited in the tissue analysis because you are biopsying one site. So there are pros and cons of that, whereas liquid biopsy can, <clears throat> can, uh, can be a broader uh, uh, such a broader analysis and really is perhaps a summation of resistance mechanisms, assuming that all of these uh, resistance sites equally contribute to the DNA <clears throat> that is found uh, in, the, uh, um, uh, in the blood. And finally, what is the, uh, uh, sort of getting down to the analytical aspect, what is the depth of analysis that we can do? So most, if you're doing these next generation sequencing assays, uh, most of the tumor-based assays are querying hundreds of genes, four to 600, depending on, uh, uh, depending on the analysis. So you find known things and you can find unknown things. You look for things that uh, you may not have previously appreciated have anything to do with a particular type of cancer or resistance mechanism because of the breadth of the analysis. Now, most liquid biopsy uh, next generation sequencing assays are more limited. They're typically less than 100 genes. And uh, you find the common things, you find things that we know for, know about, but uh, some things are uh, uh, particularly difficult uh, to find. For example, you just heard from Dr. Reyes about NTREC alterations. These are typically not found on liquid biopsies, and that has to do with the technical aspects of, of the assays themselves and, and how much uh, of, the, of the sequencing would need to be, con be, be uh, contributed to finding a TREK rearrangement. So again, it's good to know about some of the differences uh, uh, that you find in these types of assays. So uh, um, I wanted to, uh, again, highlight some of the practicalities of, um, of doing tissue-based uh, uh, studies of required resistance. And this is a, uh, from a study that uh, we published a few years ago uh, this is a study of treating patients with uh, erlotinib as first-line therapy for their EGFR mutant lung cancer. And in the study, we prospectively uh, set out to study uh, mechanisms of resistance. And I think the findings sort of illustrate the feasibility of doing repeated biopsies. Now, the caveat here is, of course, that these are done in a single center where we have access to people who can do biopsies, radiologists who can do, uh, uh, or interventional radiologists who can do biopsies or surgeons who can do biopsies. So you have to sort of take that with a little bit of a, a grain of salt. So in this study, 44 patients uh, developed uh, acquired resistance and 35 of them were able to undergo a repeat biopsy. Uh, and about 80%. So if you look at why some of those other individuals were not able to undergo biopsy, uh, it wasn't clinically feasible in some individuals or the patients refused to undergo a biopsy uh, in the minority of individuals. And of those 80% that underwent a biopsy, 11% had insufficient tumor tissue. And I think a challenge uh, for us um, you know, in, in the real world is that we think we know what the right area is to biopsy, but sometimes the, uh, uh, what, what happens in practicality is that the tumor is necrotic or there's lots of dead tissue or there's fibrosis uh, and uh, you don't have sufficient uh, uh, material there to do the types of analyses that you want. If we look at the timing here, again, a critical component as we think about next ten therapies, how long did it take uh, to get a biopsy from uh, the time um, uh, that the resistance was determined by the treating physician and the median time here is 12 days. Uh, and the bar graph shows the individual patients and the time to repeat biopsy. But you can see it ranges from uh, being able to do it immediately to uh, almost three months later. So again, lots of variability here. Uh, and in this population of individuals, the uh, biopsy guided selection of the treatment in the majority in about 75% of individuals uh, here, either using, since this was a first-liner allotment study, either second-generation drugs or therapy uh, for small cell lung cancer.
So <clears throat> let me highlight some examples to show this. And this is just to show resistance uh, mechanisms that can happen to first-line osimertinib therapy. And, and not, not to belabor the details, but I think the, uh, uh, just you get a sense that there's many different ways. And we are not uh, smart enough to figure out from the initial biopsy uh, which direction the cancers will evolve to. Uh, this, is, this is an evolutionary process in result to uh, pressure of, of, of drug treatment, and, uh, and it can, it can uh, uh, pick out many different ways to develop resistance. And I think in the uh, osimertinib frontline therapy here, uh, also there's not one dominant mechanism resistant. Everything is you know, in, in the sort of the, at most about 15% uh, of, of, of individuals. And hence, you know, doing a comprehensive analysis to look for resistance as opposed to uh, just looking for one such mechanism, I think also uh, makes sense as I've just alluded to by the, by the two different mechanisms. And the other uh, point is, uh, again, getting to that heterogeneity is that uh, this uh, is another way of looking at that. And all of the, uh, across sort of horizontally, these are all different patients and vertically are the different resistance mechanisms. So in this, what I wanted to highlight here is that in this analysis, about 15% of the patients had concurrent resistance mechanisms simultaneously, meaning that one part of the tumor can involve in one direction and a second part of the tumor or a second independent uh, a lesion can evolve in a different direction. And I think we don't completely understand how common that is or how uh, um, frequently that happens, but at least uh, this uh, provides some information that, that it can happen. And, and I think uh, adds to some of the complexity as we're thinking about uh, next generation treatments. What about from the tissue analysis? So this is now again, osimertinib resistance mechanisms uh, from tissue analysis from a recent study published uh, uh, by our colleagues at the uh, Memorial Sloan Kettering. Uh, and, I, and I think uh, you can uh, appreciate a couple of different things. Of course, when you have histology analysis, you can look for things that happen at the histologic basis. So squamous cell transformation and small cell lung cancer transformation. So state, state changes in the cancer have been described and and, and we can, and, and they're sort of highlighted in these yellow pieces of the pie here, uh, both when osimertinib is used as frontline therapy and as later line therapy. And then in blue and green, you can see sort of blue are new EGFR mutations and in green are uh, uh, other mechanisms of resistance that don't involve EGFR itself. Um, and you, again, you can see the proportions here in the first and uh, later lines of therapy. I think what's important here is that we sometimes go through this entire process, either from the plasma or from, uh, from the tumor, and we end up in the gray piece of the pie, which means we don't totally know what the mechanism resistance is, or we haven't captured it, or the cancers develop resistance in a way that it's not through a genetic alteration, which is what we're capturing by these assays. And we're left with trying to understand what to do in that uh, circumstance. So despite, the, you know, despite all the new technology, we still do have some uh, limitations. So what about sort of approaches to treating resistance? Uh, again, I think these, these vary a little bit on, the, on, on types of resistance. So uh, I think the first question often is, is there a single site of resistance versus multiple sites of resistance? Oftentimes for a single site of resistance, we think about local therapy, be it radiation therapy or surgery, when multiple areas of resistance happen, uh, we st then start to think about systemic treatment to treat the multiple sites. In general, we'd like to target the targetable. If you have a, a secondary mutation to a targeted therapy, as you heard uh, again from Dr. Reyes about the RET example, we switch to another drug that can overcome that uh, uh, secondary mutation. Sometimes we add a second drug. So I know an example of that, of adding a second drug to an EGFR inhibitor to overcome a specific RET mechanism resistance. What if, you, what if you are in that gray uh, piece of the pie where there's no specific resistance mechanism, we've done the analysis, there's no histologic transformation, there's no genetic mechanism. And, and I think here we're starting to think about are there mega, mechanism agnostic treatment strategies? And I'll show you a few examples of that. And ultimately chemotherapy is, is one that may play a role here depending on whether or not the individuals received chemotherapy. So this is an example of, of two clinical trials where a second agent, a MET inhibitor, uh, was added uh, to an EGFR inhibitor on the left-hand side to osimertinib, on the right-hand side to gefitinib. And you can see that in patients who have this particular genetic alteration, you can have um, uh, evidence of clinical benefit. You can see tumor shrinkage uh, across the board. I think when you delve into the details here, 
of how do you define meta amplification, it gets much more complicated. So on the bottom left is the definition of how that was defined. And, I, and you can see that it's not a yes or no answer. It's not a, it's not a mutation was present or absent. There are guidances to, and as to how many tumor cells do you have to analyze and what do you need to see. And similarly in the, in the bar graph on the, on the, <clears throat> the waterfall plot on the right, it's color coded based on copy number gains or immunohistochemistry. And so for some of our resistance mechanisms, the definitions are also not, uh, not quite straightforward. And I think this highlights the example, but also highlights the example that there can be clinical benefit if you identify uh, those particular mechanisms. So finally, let me just turn into, I think some of our newer approaches or one additional approach to targeting resistance. And that is to target resistance or, or target cancers that are resistant, but not, but using these resistance uh, mechanism agnostic strategies. And here, uh, two examples, both involve antibody drug conjugates. And both are meaning that these are antibodies that are linked to what are, are a, tar, a, a kind of a chemotherapeutic agent for the time being. They bind specific proteins found on tumor cells and then internalize that antibody into the tumor cells, release the toxin, and are that way delivering targeted chemotherapy to tumor cells. So for EGFR mutant lung cancers, here the, we're taking advantage of the fact that EGFR is a family, and many of these other family members are also present in cancers, including HER3. And interestingly enough, HER3 is a family member that is not a known resistance mechanism to EGFR inhibitors, unlike HER2, which is a known resistance mechanism, amplification of HER2 can happen. And so that led to the idea of using this particular antibody drug conjugate called U31402. On the left-hand side showed the sort of a drug antibody linked to a drug, in, <clears throat> which you can then deliver specifically uh, to cancers to be effective. And on the right-hand side, just some data from mouse models using patient-derived xenografts, whereby uh, we're delivering in red the drug or in blue the control. On the left-hand side, a tumor that doesn't express HER3, which is, is, is one of the outliers and the drug is not affected. And on the middle and right, two examples where the drug is being delivered uh, preclinically. And these have different resistance mechanisms. One, one model is a erlotinib resistant cancer and the second is an osimertinib resistant cancer and uh, it happens to work. Now, uh, this has been taken forward uh, to the clinic, and this is a presentation from last year's uh, WCLC conference by Dr. Yu, uh, and this will be updated again at the ESMO meeting, which is coming up in a couple of weeks, to show that this does work clinically and that there are patients who do respond. And I think in the bottom, if you look, uh, we've, we've sort of layered out the uh, EGFR mutations as well as the different resistance mechanisms. And you can see that whether uh, individual had meta amplification or C797S or a HER2 mutation or a P3 kinase mutation, there is shrinkage here. So this can be a strategy whereby if you don't have an option of getting a targeted therapy or one doesn't find a mechanism of resistance, then uh, this uh, remains an approach that is still sort of tailored towards, in this case, EGFR mutant cancers because they express HER3. And finally, the second such uh, drug that's entering the clinic where there's uh, Bendata is another antibody drug conjugate against <clears throat> a completely different protein. This is called TRO2, and it's an intracellular calcium signal transducer uh, protein, but it just happens to be present in many uh, lung cancers. Uh, and this uh, drug, again, the same idea, antibody bound to this uh, 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 drug has been tested clinically in a, in a broader range of, uh, of individuals with lung cancer. Uh, not just patients who have targetable alterations. And on the right-hand side, you see the waterfall plot uh, that was presented uh, by Dr. Lisberg at ASCO uh, this past year. And you can see that, again, there's clinical activity of this drug. There are patients' tumors that shrink, and including in patients that have EGFR mutations or alpha ranges. So both sort of for the targetable and the non-targetable, unlike the HER3 one, this is much broader approach, not specific to one uh, particular genotype.